ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Welcome uh, to this third day of the African International uh, Mediation Conference. Uh, we are having the evening session running from six o'clock uh, today, the second day of December uh, 2020. Uh, our session is uh, on the UN Security uh, Council Resolution on Women, Peace and Security. We will be taken through this uh, by mediator Jane Amiri. Uh, we commence this uh, session with the words of the national anthem recited in English. O God of all creation, bless this Let our land and, and nation. nation. Justice be Justice our be shield and, and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, uh, welcome to this evening's uh, session on the UN Security Council resolution on women, uh, peace and security. We will be taken through this uh, session by mediator Jane Amiri. Uh, mediator Jane Amiri is a mediator, a peace worker, a researcher, as well as a trainer. Uh, good evening, Jane. Uh, kindly unmute. Okay, yeah. Do you uh, hear good me? Evening, Jane? Good evening, Sarah. Uh, great to have you. Uh, kindly take us through the session. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I see. Um, there are um, many mediators on board today, um, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to join the rest of the world in uh, looking at um, 20 years since the uh, United Nations Security Council came up with a resolution 1325. So we're here today in 2020, looking at the journey that's traveled. There has been a lot that um, has been said in the last couple of uh, months about this 20 anniversary. And um, today, um, our interests will focus not so much in the details of this celebratory mood, but more on reflection of what exactly we have been able to accomplish. So I am delighted that we are also having this conversation at a time when the world is marking the 16 days of activism on gender-based uh, violence. So this conversation is indeed um, timely that we're discussing matters of peace and security as they relate uh, to women. Now, several questions may arise. Why? the interests. Why are we here today? Why the interest? We all know that mediators manage differences. And we all know that when we discuss matters of peace and matters of security, it calls for managing differences. Peace can only exist where people are able to manage their differences so they can be able to enjoy an environment where everyone lives in peace. And Sarah, may I ask, do you, um, are you able to share my presentation? 
Uh, yes, in just a minute. Okay, okay, okay. Very well, because I would like us to, you know, to combine this discussion with, uh, you know, with that um, sharing. So uh, moving on as we are waiting for- Are you for... able to see it on the screen? Yeah. yeah, yeah, now I'm able to see it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome. Yeah. So um, why exactly would we be interested as mediators to discuss the resolution 1325? Um, there's several reasons. And one of the major reasons is because um, this resolution 1325 has been hailed as a high point for being the first uh, United Nations resolution to specifically address issues of peace and security of girls and women by making explicit recognition of insecurity and conflict situations experienced by girls and women. So it makes a very specific reference to the challenges of peace and insecurity as experienced by girls and women. And so we have an interest in that specifically. Additionally, this resolution commits to address these issues of concern, issues of conflict, and issues of insecurities. Also, this resolution embraces instruments, protocols, and policies that promote and protect human rights, peace and security, and also issues that specifically address women concern, okay? So since an, um, the passing of this resolution on the 31st of October to the year 2000, this resolution has given the world a framework on which to work on, a framework that would guide any engagements and a framework that would guide any work that would be done to ensure that women and girls live in peaceful environment, safe environment, and therefore women and girls enjoy peace and security. And this framework of Resolution 1325 gives us the three, the famous three Ps, and that is prevention, protection, and participation, in addition to relief and recovery. So it becomes then very important for mediators to be involved in this framework. And I know mediators have been involved in this framework. It also becomes very important for the society to be involved in this framework. And sure enough, society has been involved and also for every person, girls and women, boys and men, to be involved in peace and security matters as relate to women. We know that this UN convention is premised on other United Nations resolutions, conventions, protocols, as well as other international instruments. So today, 
we are going to appreciate the significant progress that has been made since the year 2000. And at the same time, we'll be noting what else needs to be done because it's clear that there has been significant progress, but the, this is work in progress and there's still more that needs to be done. So moving on um, to the next uh, slide. Would like to put this resolution 1325 into context. And for purposes of our discussion today, I would like to call on each and every one of us to assess our situation at an individual level and also at the society level. And that's why today I would like us to focus our thoughts on the global, which is the resolution 1325. And we also focus on our local contexts. And that's what we'd like to borrow from those who said, we think global, but focus local. In the words of Professor Ali Mazrui, it makes reference to global, okay? It's global local situation. So how has the resolution 1325 impacted on us as individual and on the society at large. It's important to note that there have been implementation across the globe, but with varied results. So not every space in this globe has been able to do the very same work as relates to this resolution, as pertains to peace and security uh, of girls and women, that efforts have been made and we have to recognize that. So what exactly does your situation look like? If we look at the three piece framework of protection of women and girls, I, I mean, uh, prevention of uh, uh, conflicts and violence on women and girls, protection of women and girls, involvement and thus participation of women and girls and the relief and recovery from situations of conflict and, um, and uh, insecurity, okay? So then let's move on um, to our next um, slide and let's have a conversation about certain aspects. We are focusing on peace and security. Then our interests in this case should be to look at both the macro and the macro level, okay? And that's what becomes very important for us to ask, what exactly does peace look like? What is this peace that we're talking about? We know that peace 
is categorized in two broad categories of positive peace and negative peace. So in society, peace prevails when we say, when all is well, when all is well, when there is justice, when the environment is conducive. However, we also find that people live in the absence of war, in the absence of fight, physical fights, but they're not enjoying peace. And that is a situation where we refer to as a situation of negative peace, where people have decided to just let, let, let it be, let things happen. And they remain silent and they quiet, but deep inside they're hurting. And this situation prevails so much to women and to girls. Because when they live in an environment where they feel they're unable to change situation in their favor, then they go quiet, they go silent because they do not want the worst to happen. But so they do not enjoy positive peace, they live in a state of negative peace. And that's what we're saying, we need to be able to deal with this situation and make peace prevail in our society in its positive aspect. Now, when we talk about security, what kind of security are we referring to? We know that security is looked at from the point of absence of violence. And would like to say that in order for us to say there is security, then girls and women have to be protected from harm, any harm, be it emotional or physical. The girls and women should enjoy an environment that offers them emotional well-being as well as the physical well-being. They are protected from any incidences that would hurt them emotionally and also hurt them physically. There has been so much focus on physical security that has ignored the emotional well-being. And that's why people are so much affected. Women and girls are affected um, psychologically because you know, at times people hurl insults at them. They say bad things you know, to them. They hurt their uh, emotion and their esteem. And that is violence. That is a state of insecurity. We see this especially in cyber um, attacks, um, technology being used to uh, cause emotional harm. And that's why when we discuss peace and security, we'd like to have the society guided by the principle of do no harm. Do no harm principle would enable the society to ensure that girls and women are enjoying peace and security. They're in, they're in a state of stability. And so they'll be able to contribute effectively in the society. So what levels? And this matters of peace and security looked at. At times we focus so much on the international and intercommunity or intercommunal uh, peace and security issues 
but they're very important levels of peace and security, starting with the intrapersonal, the peace within a person. Psychologists, uh, counselors, and social workers will tell you that a person who does not enjoy peace internally is a person who will generate negative peace wherever they are. And a person who does not enjoy peace internally is an insecure person. So it's important then to ensure that girls and women have peace internally, so they are stable. Their mental framework is fine. Their mind is positive and is well protected in terms of what comes in and what goes out. So it has to also do with the information that the society gives. What does the society, for example, say about girls? What does the society define girls to be? What do they, what, what, what are girls told in the society? Are they told they're the human beings that God has made so wonderfully and they are the leaders in the society and they can be what they want and desire to be? Are they offered all the opportunities that they require? Do they hear this positive um, words in the society? That forms the interpersonal peace and constitute the interpersonal security. Intrapersonal. Then let's look at the next, the other level. That is the intra personal. That is between one person and the other. How do we relate in the society? How do girls relate with the boys? How do girls relate with the men? How do girls relate with women? How do women relate with boys, relate with men, and relate with girls in the society? That is one person with the other. And that relationship that interaction can create a state of peace or a state of security or lack of peace and a state of insecurity. And so these levels are important when we're thinking about uh, matters of peace and security. We should not just think about matters of peace and security at levels that are, are, are beyond the intrapersonal and interpersonal without considering both intrapersonal and interpersonal levels of peace and security. And then we we'll move to the level of intra community and intercommunity. Peace within the community, security within the community, and also peace between one uh, community and the other community, that becomes very important because we know that women suffer a lot in situations of conflicts and situations of war. Um, also in situations of violence, it's the women who suffer most, women and girls, because they are victimized for whatever that happens. Additionally, they are the caregivers. So those who are wounded will end up at home, being taken care of by the girls and by the women. And that's why intra and inter community peace and security comes very important. And then with inter community, uh, peace and security will move to the level of the international peace and security. And that is the level where lots of focus 
is placed. And we know that our media focuses on matters of international uh, conflict and uh, international peace and security issues more than they do focus on interpersonal, intrapersonal, intra-community levels of conflict. So it's important as we discuss that we look at this, uh, you know, uh, six levels because they are so crucial for us when we're looking at the journey traveled and what has been realized. Trauma of lack of peace and trauma of insecurity lives within people, within the person. And that is so transferable to the rest of the members of the society. And that's why it becomes very important to address issues of mental well-being. So then let's look at the yardstick that we we'll use for purposes of addressing issues of peace and security. We all know that um, resolution 1325 addresses or seeks to address the increase, uh, the increasing targeting of girls and women in armed uh, conflict or during armed conflict. It also seeks to impact, to address the impact of armed conflict on girls and women. For example, the impact of conflict on displacement of persons, girls being displaced, women being displaced, and also uh, being turned into refugees. Also, um, it, uh, Resolution 1325 seeks to address the role of women in prevention, management, and resolution of armed conflict. Quite a big challenge there. And also, it seeks to address the participation of women in decision making on peace efforts. So if we look at this yardstick that we have on addressing the increasing targeting of girls and women during conflict and conflict, we see that conflicts have actually been with us as part of human nature, where people disagree. But armed conflict uh, breed violence and untold suffering, especially for girls and women. We know that during armed conflict, girls and women are taken hostage. We've had several cases all over uh, the world and specifically Africa, where girls and women are converted into soldiers. Uh, we have child soldiers. We also have girls and women being forcefully made wives of armed soldiers, the cases of sexual molestation and violation during uh, armed conflict. And this is that targeting that we're talking about. There are people who say, well, our countries are safe. Like they would think about countries where they've not been, uh, they've not had real pronounced cases of uh, armed conflict. But 
think about cases, situations of elections in Africa. We all know that during election time in Africa, there's usually armed conflict. Politicians have guns. You find youth, and in most cases, they are male youth, roaming around in the streets and in the villages, armed with machetes, armed with uh, clubs, but they could be wooden, but we know what those clubs can do to human lives. They clobber people, they beat them up, we know that, and arrest, cause untold harm. So those are situations of armed conflict in our local setups. So what impact has there been of those armed conflicts? You and I know whenever there is armed conflict times, people get displaced, houses are burned down, uh, people, uh, girls can go to school, uh, food is scarce, there is fear, you know, diseases increase, institutions collapse, poverty increases, all that is the impact that we're talking about. And during election time, women candidates are targeted with violence. So violence is used as a tool to deny women the opportunity to take up leadership. And that is an impact that has also to be looked at from this framework at our local levels. Also, when we look at the role of women in prevention, management and resolution of armed conflict, as you said, that's a big challenge, but we know that women have what it takes to participate in all matters of peace and security. Women are decision makers. The only challenge has been that they are denied the opportunity to sit at decision making tables and deal with these matters. Women have the capacity to resolve uh, conflicts. But if we look at the structure of uh, dealing with the armed conflict in our societies, we'll find that that is usually a reserve of, for example, um, the army. But if you look at the hierarchies in the army, you will see that women are very few in high uh, and decision-making ranks. And even generally, women who are in the army are very few. And so that opportunity is lost. But how about prevention? We know that women have been hailed as peacemakers, no? Um, and they play this role very well because they know how conflicts affect them. Through nurturing their children, they teach them peace. They teach them conflict resolution. And that is a way of preventing conflict in the society. Also, women do manage situations of conflict. And they're very good at that. We know how they pass on information. Women network information. There are people who say they gossip, but they network information, and that is very useful. In any decision-making, information is very important. In peace work and security information is very important. And women are very good in networking information. But there is also another bit where women are involved in causing conflict. And that is through how they socialize the young ones. They socialize, they socialize the children. Also, 
how they deal with information that they get or the information that they have. How, what kind of information do they transmit? And that is a big challenge to women. We know that women tell the stories and they tell the narratives of peace based on also what the society wants. So they are under the control of patriarchy. That institution that decides what is good for the society. And so women fit in there. But when we look at generally at matters of peace and security in our society, we realize that women are great contributors in ensuring peace prevail and security because they have a big interest in it and they are working, but the challenges are major. And we're going to look at that later on. So the participation of women in decision-making is very crucial as far as matters of peace and uh, efforts are concerned. And I would like all of us to reflect on how many women are participating at our local level. Okay, so moving on now, where are we at? Where are we at? It's 20 years, where are we at? From the global to the local. Where are we? Each one of us is anchored somewhere in the society. At your level, what would you say? And let's look at some of these aspects. One, knowledge level as pertains to peace, and security matters as they relate to girls and women. Have knowledge levels in the societies increased? Where can someone find information? Is there data, for example? If today we want to know how many women are involved in peace processes. Where can someone go in your, com in, in your location to get that information? I know now we are globally connected by the internet. Are there web pages, websites, where someone can be able to get this information about the resolution 1325? Are there places where someone can be able to get information about women peacekeepers, about women mediators, about women in peacekeeping missions, for example? That information is not sufficient, not readily available, and not in a language that is understandable by all women. So there is need for efforts to be made in that area because without knowledge, we remain at lower levels. It's knowledge that uplifts people and uplifts societies in making sure that they engage it in what needs to be done on matters, peace and security. So the other yardstick, that we could look at in just being able to say where we are at is the duty bearers. So who are the duty bearers on matters, peace and security as regards to women? We know that United Nations uh, resolution uh, enacted by member states. So governments, are at the pinnacle of bearing duty. And they are the pillar of enabling 
this resolution to be realized. So what effort have governments made all over the world? Efforts have been made. And locally in Kenya, we know that there have been national action uh, plan as relates to um, the resolution 1325. But there is a responsibility placed on all government to ensure peace prevailed in their countries and specifically for women and girls. How peaceful are our neighborhoods, how safe are our neighborhoods for women and girls, how are women and girls treated in our neighborhoods, how have things changed? In the last couple of months with the entry of COVID-19, we have seen a rise in cases of gender-based violence and most victims have been girls and women. In Kenya specifically, we know there have been many reports, very disturbing reports about girls' defilement, about girls getting pregnant since uh, schools closed. And this is a big challenge for our societies. So we can say, and rightly so, that our societies are not yet safe enough for girls and for women. Now, how has peace and security been embraced for girls and women at our local levels? Since the resolution in 2000, in the year 2000, there have been lots of legislations, what say, that have been enacted in societies. There have been policies and there have been programs that have been, uh, that have been done. In, no, in Kenya specifically, the constitution of 2010 has put a lot of focus on the gender, on the gender. justice. Justice. to ensure that there is equality and fairness and justice for girls and women, of course, and boys and, uh, um, and men. So that constitution as a framework that guides all the legislation in, 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 in Kenya, it has promoted matters of peace and security for girls and women. But the challenge has been, has this constitution been implemented as it should? There have been gaps, we know that, but what needs to be done? There is need to focus on peace and security of girls and women. And there is need to focus on the gender imbalances because these imbalances is what causes lack of peace and insecurity. Also, um, we had to look at the goodwill. Is there enough goodwill? to deal with issues of peace and security for women and girls. We look at goodwill at the political level. We look at goodwill at the social level and goodwill at the economic uh, level. At the political level, is there goodwill? Think about the leadership in place in our countries. 
what priorities do they give to the area of peace and security? Legislations in parliaments, in senates, in uh, county assemblies, allocations of budgets. Where does peace and security for girls and women feature? Usually not at the high levels. And so there is need to promote and to encourage uh, goodwill, political goodwill. And we, we, we know we have a challenge in our country when it comes to the issue of uh, gender balance in institutions, in parliament, in the Senate, where the two third gender requirement has not been met. And it has been a long journey trying to address the two third gender issue in parliament. And so it's important that these issues are addressed because they have a bearing on the peace and security of girls and women. Um, on matters of social uh, goodwill, we all know that every society has institutions and has a culture that drives those in social institutions. What does our culture um, say about girls and women? How does our culture promote peace and security for women and girls? We know it's wanting. The social institutions that are in the society, for example, when we talk about elders, who are the elders in the society? If today we say elders, who do we refer to? In most cases, it will be the male. Who are the mediators in our societies? In most cases, there will be them elders, who will in most cases be the male. Who are the social army in most cases they are there the male okay and that's where we'll need to bring on board the goodwill that will uh, enable girls and women to enjoy peace and security and so it becomes important to have that social goodwill religious institution education institutions um, all cultural institutions should focus on matters of peace and security for girls and women. And the, how about economic goodwill? Do we see corporate institutions focusing on uh, peace and security? How about budgetary allocations for our, uh, countries and our societies? Where is the money put? Is it on peace and security for girls and women? That becomes important. When we send our peace keepers, where are women and men comparatively? You will find that the men are more. And who suffers consequences? The women. So we need to be able to look at some of these issues. And that's where the goodwill becomes very important. How about uh, uh, stakeholders in this process? Who is involved in peace work or ensuring that peace prevails, security prevails? There is need for strategic partnership, government, civil society organization, at the international level, regional level, national level, and community level. We need to have collaboration 
and coordination so that we can be able to ensure there is peace and security for girls and women. Something is being done, but not enough. So we need to have this effort uh, strengthened so that we can deliver. Now, how about issues of building synergies? Because that is very important for all stakeholders, all players should come together and focus to ensure that girls and women enjoy peace and security and our societies are safe. And lastly, is about monitoring and evaluation and learning. We know that cross-learning is very important and learning from best practices. But this effort have not been as they should, and we're not seeing information that can guide us into being able to understand what has been done so far, what hasn't been done, why it hasn't been done, what the priority areas are, and what needs to be done. So the extent to which countries, societies and communities have been able to realize the resolution 1325 is crucial. And this should be known. And only when we know can we be able to explore best practices and also to become innovative. There is need for innovation when it comes to matters of peace and security for girls and women. We cannot continue doing things the same as we did before uh, the year 2000. And we expect that in 2020 moving forward, things will change for the better. We have to ensure that we are innovative and we are moving progressively and utilizing all the tools that are available and especially utilizing technology for the better. So then, good people, in conclusion, um, Sarah, are you able to put the last slide for us to, to move on together? Uh, Jane, hi, please continue so that we can see you at this point. Just carry on. Um, okay. Um, um, thank you. And that sounds like Wangari. <laughs> okay. So then, in conclusion, um, I would say that um, this conversation was to make us reflect on where we are at, at our level. And I would like to conclude by saying that Resolution 1325 has awakened the awareness of the need to enable girls and women enjoy peace and security. And it has made uh, governments and other stakeholders to come together to ensure that there is prevention of uh, insecurity, there is protection of women from insecurity conflicts, and also there is space for women to participate in matters of peace and security. So the framework that, uh, artic, uh, that uh, resolution 1325 has given to the society, it's very important. It is a guide and therefore we need to anchor everything that we do on our day-to-day -day lives on this framework so that we can be able to realize optimum potential for every person in the society. And in, to end um, 
the discussion on my part, I would like to say it's important that women enjoy peace and security so that they can be able to become productive members of the society. Because if people do not enjoy peace and, trans, um, peace and security, they cannot perform, at, they cannot function at their optimum. And therefore the society is called to ensure peace and security prevail for all in the society to enjoy. And specifically for girls and women who have for a long time been denied uh, the enjoyment of peace and security. Thank you very much. Asante sana. Oh, Wangari, we don't hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mediator Jane Amiri. And uh, uh, where mediators are on the call, I suggest that you kindly uh, join me in giving her a clap where you are uh, for this uh, particular session. Today is the second day of December and uh, we had uh, mediator Jane Amiri uh, giving us a presentation. And uh, her pre the presentation that she was taking us through is on the United Nations uh, Security Council resolution that is the UNSCR 1325 on women, peace and security. And this is in our celebration of the 20th anniversary of uh, this uh, United Nations um, uh, resolution. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mediator Jane Amiri, for helping us to go, uh, to go through the, and understand uh, coming from a gender responsive uh, programming when it comes to women, peace, and security. And we believe that from this discussion that uh, mediators now have a much better understanding and also appreciation of uh, what this uh, United Nations Security Council resolution stands for, what it's supposed to mean for girls, for women, and also for society, and also where mediators could uh, plug in. So this session uh, was to help us to spotlight the emergent role of women in mediation leadership. Secondly, to join in the global celebration of the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council resolution, that is UNSCR 1325 on women, peace and security, and also to assess the challenges and to celebrate the successes attained. So once again, I take this opportunity to thank our session presenter, mediator Jane Amiri, who is a mediator, a peace worker, and a researcher, and also a trainer. As we conclude in, on, in this session, I wish to remind colleagues that we have the next session starting off at 8 p.m. today. Our session at 8 p.m. is an international masterclass training, and uh, it's an international masterclass training on mediation practice, uh, business models, strategy, and marketing, how to design an enriching mediation and uh, one-stop dispute resolution practice. So we believe that it's a very exciting um, session that's coming up. Uh, the session will be with training facilitators uh, courtesy of the Bar Association of San Francisco um, in USA. And also we will be having a surprise guest who you do not want to miss or who you really want to be um, there for. So we look forward uh, for colleagues who are on, uh, on the WhatsApp group, please look out for the uh, poster that is also going to let you know who's the surprise guest that we have for ourselves um, today evening. And we thank you for joining us. We will close this session with the words of the national anthem. And then after that, everyone can go and get some, uh, some, something to keep them uh, warm and something to also keep them uh, very energetic for the session that's coming up uh, at 8 p.m. today. The link to use for the session is the same one that you have used to join this particular session. Feel free to uh, also alert the other colleagues who are in other networks that you're in because we believe that great things happen when mediators come together. So the words of our national anthem in Kiswahili. <laughs> So once again, I thank you for joining us and uh, please have a very good evening and uh, God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.